Every day, we experience resilience, but where it begins is often invisible. It's in the quiet choices people make, in the plans laid long before a crisis hits, and what stands strong today wasn't built overnight. In today's world, we need to be more resilient than ever. And in the face of climate change, so must the places where we live, work, rest, and play. You change the way how you move and what you eat, but the living part, there was no drastic change in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Cities cover just 2% of the Earth's land surface, yet they house over half the world's population. And the more they grow, the more vulnerable they become as we sprawl further into the wilderness. As an architect, you can actually have a profound impact on the community. As we build protection from our planet's changing climate, we must also protect the planet itself. We test for pretty much anything nature can throw at us. If you want to see how our cities are building the resilience of tomorrow, you're in the right place. A compact lifestyle is the quickest approach to a resilient lifestyle. If you develop horizontally, and, and that's described as urban sprawl, you're consuming a lot of land and resources. We need to have more avenues to get to where we need to go. That's a choice other than the car. And that's done by changing urban cores to have all the services that people need. Kind of the 15 minute city so that everyone can live a lifestyle where they're not traveling 45 minutes to get to basic services of work or play that have echo access to outdoor space. Typically, when urban sprawl meets the wilderness, it's known as the wildland urban interface, and it's where climate change hits hardest. So when we build there, resilience is tested every day. It's a global phenomenon, and in the U.S. alone, nearly 40% of buildings are located in this zone. Before we take a look to see how we're creating resilient infrastructure in our cities, let's journey to the wildland urban interface to see how property is being protected in the face of climate change. We're heading up Mark West Springs Road, a few miles outside of Santa Rosa. It's a beautiful area, but also very remote. And so we're going to check out a client's house of mine who I consulted with on several occasions in order to improve her home's resilience to wildfire. This is Stuart, a certified wildfire mitigation specialist who educates and advises on how to best protect your home. I start by looking at the property from a macro level, looking at weather events, and then I look at things like how plants are placed and also looking at structure hardening. And this home has been nicely designed. So there's a few things you need to be mindful if you're living in an environment like this. Number one, yes, inherently, you're in a more remote location. What's happening recently with the weather? How am I maintaining my property? Am I hardening it and maintaining the hardening? Typically, it might be your gutters have fuel in them. If you install gutter covers over the gutters, you won't have you know three or four inches of leaves or debris in the gutter. You're looking at keeping your zero to five foot zone clear or highly maintained. There are no municipal hydrants here, so you want to have stored water on the property. And then another one would be, you know, putting away those combustible items before you leave. And then a fifth one might be your vents. Here we have an activated vent so that when heat is exposed to it, it will seal itself off and they're designed to minimize the infiltration of embers. We cannot control the forest. We cannot control the neighbor. What we can control is our property. Stewart's talked about some of the practical things you can do to increase your property's resiliency. But does it really matter what our buildings are made of? People tend to put a lot more emphasis on the way a home looks rather than what it's constructed of. The design of buildings is really changing. As we're having more extreme weather events, then it has become more of an issue in making sure that we're choosing the right materials, the right assemblies to make it more resilient. The water barrier, the air barrier, uh, the fire resistive barrier and the thermal barrier. We need to make sure that those are continuous throughout. So we take all that into consideration. And a lot of the time, those elements that we're looking at for air, water, fire, they overlap. And Tammy would know, RDH Building Science are one of the leading building enclosure consultancy firms in North America today. We have a indoor laboratory, but we also have big mock-ups that we do outdoors at our test facility that we reconstruct whole configurations, whole walls, and we can do performance testing on those. 
and we work a lot with manufacturers, with government agencies to perform this testing to come up with details that work and designs that work. The glass at a minimum should be tempered because it's more resistant to heat. If your glass breaks, then that's an area where embers can just come into the house. Metal windows, fiberglass windows that are made with fire-resistant resin, we need to incorporate. Choosing something like mineral wool, that's basically putting a fire blanket around your building. We've done tests with mineral wool and with foam, and you peel back the mineral wool in that water barrier, the air barrier is still in perfect shape. It's really a superior material. Smoke damage is a huge issue. Having a proper continuous air barrier is really important. A lot more areas are experiencing flooding. We need to plan for flooding 24 inches up the building. Actually, a lot of these building materials double, so it's not that hard to design for all of these when you know what you're looking for. As we've seen, building resiliency isn't just about emergency threats. It's about quiet, understated, and everyday resiliency. I have one client who called me every week after the building was completed and said, Christian, the building is so comfortable. I feel so well in there. It is very efficient, and I almost don't want to leave anymore. And this home here in greater Los Angeles epitomizes sustainable and resilient living. Passive House is an international construction standard for buildings from small houses to large-scale buildings. It's the highest energy performance standard in the world and it follows five principles. You're looking at the building envelope, climate appropriate insulation, you're looking at high performance windows, you're looking at an airtight envelope so you can control what goes inside and out of the building, you're looking at a ventilation system and you try to avoid thermal bridging. It wraps the entire building, it wraps the walls, it wraps the roof and it becomes like a jacket. All this together creates the best and most efficient in energy performance and this way create a sustainable building. In all of Passive House projects we have designed, we don't have crawl spaces. We have a non-vented roof, so another option where embers cannot get into the building where it's enclosed. I can bring the fresh air into the building, I send it to a filter, and there you bring 100% stale air out of the building. When I have air pollution on the outside, I can clean it, I can filter it. You don't hear anything, you're completely sound insulated. So those are the benefits. And of course, its energy efficiency ensures cost savings for the homeowner. We mostly have to deal with power outages in the future. What does it mean for your house? If you don't have any backup systems, a passive house provides you a space which is easier for you to stay in there. We have to make our buildings more resilient. We design them actually with the higher temperatures in mind from the global warming perspective. And the cool thing about resiliency, it can be scaled up. The five principles of passive house is actually advantageous to larger structures. The larger the structure, you actually have a better ratio of envelope to building area. And that's what's happening in other places across the globe, like in Vancouver, where it's central to the city's zero emissions building plan. Meanwhile, back here in Los Angeles, architecture firm Johnson Fain shapes cities with a sustainable and resilient framework. Building resilience means that you're looking at kind of the holistic approach to a structure and how it's gonna be in the future as well as the present. The idea of developing urban centers is important. The biggest impact you can have is reuse something that exists today. If we build a building which is high carbon and it causes contribution to climate change through its construction and operation, we should actually shortchange resiliency. And you need to have resilient structures that are an enjoyable environment for people to live in. Like Citrus Commons, a revitalized hub in Sherman Oaks, blending modern offices, comfortable living, and vibrant retail. In California, we had like the 94 Northridge earthquake, you know, that changed the tall building design. Now we have fires which are looking at the wildlife urban interface. Our access to water here is challenged. We import 85% of our water. When you have a rain event, a lot of the homes aren't capturing the water and it goes straight out to the ocean. And that needs to kind of be repositioned and looked at. Each one of these brings up issues that we look at closely and then they convert it into code later. There will be new structures, but a lot of the work that's coming forward will be refurbishing existing buildings. And this will have the largest impact on our environment. And through by proper material selection, as an architect, you can actually have a profound impact on the community. And these impacts increase our resiliency to climate change, financial, and property loss, and ensure we're safer, living more comfortable, prosperous, and healthy lives.
See you next time as we go beneath the surface.